Hey guys, Carl and I had to wrap up chapter 9 with you. Uh, we're starting with section 5, which begins our coverage of the eye. And we rely more on our vision than any other special sense. Our visual receptors are contained in our eyes and they detect light and detailed images. And they're supported by accessory structures that are going to help protect, lubricate, and support the eyes in different ways. Uh, there are four accessory structures. We're going to start off with talking about the eyelids, or what are also called the palpebrae. Uh, they have association with exocrine glands that we'll mention in a second, but they're essentially an extension of the skin. Blinking is going to keep the surface lubricated and free from dust and debris. Our eyelashes are going to help with that as well. Um, the upper and lower lid are going to meet at what we call the lateral canthus and the medial canthus. And then those large sebaceous glands are associated with eyelashes just like other hairs. Uh, what they do is secrete a lipid-rich product to keep the eyelids from sticking. And the lacrimal caruncle, which is kind of our corner of the eye, um, that's why it produces thick secretions that create the gritty deposits after a night's sleep. And then infections can occur here, what we would normally refer to as a sty. Now the second accessory is superficial epithelium. There are some very thin layers on the surfaces of the eye, and the inner surfaces of the eyelids and the white surface of the eyeball itself are covered by a thin transparent mucous membrane called conjunctiva. It contains many free nerve endings and is very sensitive. Irritation to this area is called conjunctivitis or otherwise known as pink eye. And it does extend to the edges of the cornea, which is another transparent layer, but it's a part of the outer fibrous layer of the eye. We're going to talk about that more in a second. And the cornea itself is also covered by a delicate corneal epithelium. Um, the third structure is uh, associated with the production, secretion, and removal of tears. There's a constant flow of tears to keep the surface of the eyeball moist and clean. It reduces friction, removes debris, prevents bacterial infection, and provides nutrients and oxygen for the conjunctival epithelium. Uh, the lacrimal apparatus actually includes all these structures here in purple, and it produces, distributes, and removes tears. Uh, the lacrimal gland itself provides the key ingredients and most of tear volume. Uh, the lacrimal canals, which you can see superior and inferior canals here, um, they direct your tears either out of the corner of the eye or down the nasolacrimal duct, which carries tears uh, to the nasal cavity. Our last accessory structure are our extrinsic eye muscles. They're also called the oculomotor muscles. There are six of them. And here's a picture of those uh, extrinsic muscles as well as a table that point out the muscle and its action. And that's all you really need to jot down here as far as this table. Know that the inferior rectus helps the eyes look down. The medial rectus helps the eyes look medially. Uh, the inferior oblique helps the eyes roll, uh, look up, and laterally. And you can see that our eye here kind of looks like a full sphere, which we cannot see outwardly because um, it's covered up by other uh, parts of the body, but it is technically... Uh, spherical. Its diameter is nearly 2.5 centimeters and weighs about 8 grams. And uh, it's a very sophisticated visual instrument. It does share space in the orbit uh, with muscles, nerves, blood vessels, and the lacrimal gland. It's divided into two cavities that give the eye its shape and it is hollow. Uh, the large posterior region contains a vitreous body and the anterior cavity filled with a watery fluid called aqueous humor. There are three layers of the eye, the outer fibrous, the vascular, and the deep inner. We're going to talk about each one real quick. Um, most of the ocular surface is covered by sclera, a dense fibrous connective tissue. It's what creates the white of the eye. It's the thickest over the posterior portion, and the six extrinsic eye muscles insert there. It is also continuous with the cornea. The cornea has no blood vessels, so um, the cells of the cornea receive oxygen and nutrients from tears. Injury to the cornea must be treated immediately and can result in a transplant. And the lens, which is right here in this diagram, um, lies posterior to the cornea to help us focus on visual images. So that outer fibrous layer is right here in white. Now the vascular layer is the next one in yellow, and it um, contains our iris ciliary body and the choroid body. The iris forms a boundary between the eye's anterior and posterior chambers, also controls light entry with the pupil. The ciliary body attaches to sensory ligaments of the lens, and then the choroid body separates the fibrous and inner layer and contains a capillary network that delivers oxygen and nutrients to the inner layer, which is what we'll talk about last, and that's the neural part, and um, it contains photoreceptors we call rods and cones. Which leads us into the next section of the chapter, uh, photoreceptors and how they respond to light. Our rods and cones are primarily responsible for this. Um, 
They are called photoreceptors because they detect photons or basic units of light, and the rods provide the CNS with information about the presence or absence of photons. They're very sensitive, and they allow us to see in dim conditions. Now, the cones provide information about the wavelengths of photons, and they're less sensitive and function only in bright light. But the cones also are what provide us with our ability to see color because there are three types of cones, blue, green, and red. Each cone contains pigments sensitive to their respective color wavelength. And when they are stimulated, there are very com various combinations that account for our perception of colors. Uh, persons unable to distinguish certain colors have some form of color blindness, which usually results if one of these types is absent or non-functional. Uh, the most common is red-green, and uh, that's when the red cones are missing, so you cannot distinguish between red and green light. And this is a common uh, test to see if you are colorblind. If you couldn't see the number 12 there, you might be some form of colorblind. Um, photoreceptor structure. Um, each receptor contains an outer segment with a membranous disc containing visual pigments. These pigments uh, absorb light and they have derivatives of rhodopsin, which is opsin plus pigment retinol that is synthesized from vitamin A to help with that absorption. And a photoreceptor responds to light by changing its rate of neurotransmitter release. Um, once a neurotransmitter is released, the message is relayed from photoreceptors to bipolar cells to the ganglion cells within the retina. Uh, those ganglion cells converge at the optic disc and then leave the eye as the optic nerve. The visual information is then relayed to the visual cortex of the occipital lobe. And finally, we get a sensory map of the field of vision and an image in front of us. So the visual pathway, as you can see, is very complex. And on page 327, they have this diagram. And they show you how at the optic chiasm, a partial crossover of nerve fibers occurs. And that's right here. Um, so this is where we kind of get our combined visual field while we have a nerve fiber on the outside that stays to the right and to the left and so you can only see that on the right and only see part of that image on the left. Alright, 9-7 um, covers uh, the ear and um, equilibrium and hearing are provided by the internal ear and we kind of think of ourselves as a receptor complex located in the temporal uh, bone of the skull. Uh, the equil equilibrium is going to be provided by the ear and it informs us of the position of the body in space by monitoring gravity, linear acceleration, and rotation. Hearing is going to also be provided by the ear and that enables us to detect and interpret sound waves. The basic receptor mechanism for both of these senses is the same uh, and those are hair cells which are mechanoreceptors like we talked about earlier in the chapter. The complex structure of the ear permits hair cells to respond to different stimuli and provide input, input for both centers. The anatomy of the ear is broken down into three divisions, the external, middle, and internal ear. The external ear is the invisible portion, contains the auricle, um, which is the outer edge of our ear, collects and directs sound waves towards the middle ear. The middle ear is this smaller section here. Um, it's a chambered and it's located in the thickened portion of the temporal bone, collects and amplifies sound waves, and transmits them to the appropriate portion of the internal ear, which contains all these fancy structures here, most importantly, uh, the cochlea. Um, these sensory organs are essential for hearing and equilibrium. The hearing process itself it involves many complex interactions. Um, hair cells are the receptors of the internal ear, and each hair cell communicates with a sensory neuron by continually releasing uh, a small quantity of neurotransmitter. The free surface of these cells are supported by 80 to 100 long microvilli called stereocilia. When distorted, they stimulate the decrease or increase of the release of a neurotransmitter, and it's by whatever direction they get moved. Um, the more they are stimulated, the more intense a sound will be sensed. Um, the senses of equilibrium and hearing are both provided by the receptors of the internal ear, and um, those occur through the cochlear duct, uh, which is found in the cochlea. And the structures and air spaces of the external and middle ear are going to help capture and transmit the sound to the cochlea so that we do provide um, hearing or an acoustic response. Uh, this picture outlines the steps in the reception of sound and the process of hearing. Um, step one would be sound waves arrive at the tympanic membrane. Movement of the tympanic membrane causes displacement of the auditory ossicles. Uh, movement of the stapes at the oval window establishes pressure waves. Uh, the pressure waves distort the uh, basilar membrane. And then vibration of the basilar membrane causes vibration of those hair cells that will then release a neurotransmitter uh, to relay information to the central nervous system and basically give us sound. 
Um, lastly, aging is accompanied by a noticeable decline in the special senses, and um, that includes gradual reductions in smell and taste sensitivity, a uh, tendency towards presbyopia and uh, cataract formation in the eyes, and then a progressive loss of hearing or presbycusis. And then uh, all of these are due to a lack of replacement of neurons, which leads to an inevitable decline in the sensory function. All right, guys, that is it. We're done, and I'll see you next time.